Act of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Well, hello and welcome to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Great to be here with you today. And I am excited because I am speaking um, on my new microphone, a condenser microphone. So hopefully this will help me in my recording and podcast endeavors. Um, very excited. It's a great blessing to uh, be able to utilize this and uh, hopefully the recording quality will be a little better and it will just be easier on me. I'm not holding a sure SM58 anymore. This microphone is right in front of me, so I can uh, uh, record these podcasts with relative effortlessness. So thank you for listening today. I hope that you have had a great Christmas. I am recording this on Christmas Day. My family, we had our uh, Christmas time last week, and so I came back to the Lubbock, Texas area on Christmas Eve, and so here I am on Christmas Day. It's actually kind of nice because I'm able to relax a little bit before I head back to work next week. So I um, hope you had a great Advent season, and here we are in the Christmas season. If you don't remember me speaking of this before, Christmas is 12 days. It's called Christmas Tide. Um, it runs from December 25th to January 5th, which is when the Eastern Orthodox Church celebrates Christmas Day. Um, that's where you get the song, The 12 Days of Christmas, from. Um my mom, her parents, my grandparents, uh, her dad's birthday was on the first day of Christmas and her mom's birthday was on the last day of Christmas. She didn't even know about that until I told her recently because uh, her birthday was on January 5th. And uh, so uh, the way that works in liturgical seasons is you have Advent, Advent, um, and then Christmas, Christmas tide, and then January 6th is Epiphany. And so uh, January 5th is the last day of Christmas. And then after Epiphany, you have ordinary time until you get to Ash Wednesday, which is February 22nd next year. Ash Wednesday then runs 40 days, not including the Sundays, uh, reminiscent of Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days and fasting. And then you have Easter, which is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. And next year it will be April 9th. That is why Easter changes days all the time. Then you have 50 days and you have Pentecost. Uh, I say all of that because the psalm we are going to be looking at today, Psalm 81, was clearly, uh, the setting is clearly for the Feast of Booths. Uh, there are seven primary Jewish feasts. Um, the, and, and today, Jewish people today even still observe these feasts. And so you have Passover. All of these can be found in Leviticus 23, uh, but you have Passover and, and we're mostly familiar with Passover, at least what it is. It is remembering when the angel of death passed over the children of Israel who applied the blood of the lamb to their doors. And by the way, all of these feasts really are typologies of what was to come in the new covenant in Jesus Christ. So there was pa there's Passover, there's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It is a seven-day feast. It begins on the day following the start of Pasto, uh, Passover. And, and so that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, then you have the Feast of First Fruits. Uh, the Feast of First Fruits, this is one of three Jewish harvest feasts to thank and honor God for what he has provided to them. And you have the Feast of Weeks, or... Pentecost. Again, there's some connection between the Jewish faith and the Christian faith. There's some typology here. And so the Feast of Weeks or the uh, Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks is the second of the three harvest feasts and it occurs exactly seven weeks after the Feast of First Fruits. And it's also called Pentecost, obviously meaning uh, 50 days. And traditionally, people were expected to bring the, the first harvest of grain to the Lord, including two unleavened loaves of bread. Again, all of this is in Leviticus 23. And then you have the Feast of Trumpets. And this is when God commands his people to rest. And it's often began, uh, begun with a trumpet sound. And it's a, the trumpet sound for us as Christians is associated with the rapture or the time when Jesus will return 
for his bride. Then you have the Day of Atonement. Uh, this is in Leviticus uh, 23, but it's also in Leviticus uh, 16. And this is when the people were to make atonement or to make restitution for the wrongs they committed. And so um, as an act of obedience, they would sacrifice a an unblemished lamb so that they could sacrifice it to the Lord. And then we have the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And this is always celebrated. It always follows the Day of Atonement. The Feast of Tabernacles celebrates God's provision and protection for the people of Israel during their 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And as I mentioned, uh, Jewish people today even still honor and observe these feasts and even do this for the Feast of Booths. What they will do is often they would set up a temporary shelter, a tent or something like that, and they would... Um, they would stay in those temporary structures. Again, remembering the time in the wilderness when God protected his people. So those are the seven feasts that the Jewish people hold and that they observe. And in this psalm, we're in Psalm 81 today, continuing through the psalm project. By the way, I know I've taken a lengthy break. I was very busy the past few weeks. And so I'm back at it and glad to be back at it. Um, psalm 81, the setting is clearly... The Feast of Booths. How do I know that? Verse 3 says, blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. <laughs> you can't get more clear than that. It is the Feast of Booths. Um, it begins like a hymn, but most of it is a divine pronouncement in which God reminds the is uh, Israel of the Exodus and the nation's subsequent apostasy. And we've gone over this before. God provides for his people, he protects his people, and then they rebel. <laughs> and that, that's the pattern in our lives many times as well. So Psalm 81, it, the title is to the choir master according to uh, Githith of Asaph. It is another Psalm of Asaph, as the next one will be as well. So let me read for you Psalm 81. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song. Sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the, at the full moon on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress, I called and I delivered you. I answered you in a secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. All right, so let's get into this a little bit. I've already given you several um, elements of background on this, but um, <clears throat> verse two begins with the psalmist saying to uh, raise a song and sound the tambourine. This psalm, uh, the psalms teach us by example to worship with exuberance, and this is a perfect example. We often see phrases like uh, that, that ask us or command us rather to use the timbrel and the harp and the lyre and dance even in Psalm 150, clapping the hands, and these are elements that we really should take to heart and heed as instructions for how we worship God. Verse 3, I've already mentioned this verse, but uh, blow the trumpet at the new moon. The, the Bible occasionally mentions a special celebration that took place at the time of the new moon. There are several examples, but let me give you one. Uh, 1 Samuel 25, or I'll give you a couple of them. 
Uh, this is, David said this to Jonathan. He said, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit at table with the king. But let me go that I might, I might hide myself in the field till the third day at evening. And then 2 Kings 4.23, And he said, Why will you go with him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And then um, Amos 8.5, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances. And then there's even some uh, references to this new moon in Colossians, Colossians 2.16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, and so uh, this, the Bible mentions uh, these celebrations that occur um, around the time of the new moon, when whenever the new moon took place, and often our Christian liturgical celebrations and the the things that we observe uh, coincide with Jewish celebrations, and so sometimes there is a correlation between the patterns of the moon, uh, nature's patterns, if you want to call them that. that. That's why Easter is different every year, because it is always the first full moon after the um, after the spring equinox, the first, full, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. And so we see these sort of patterns and connections to Jewish faith and Christian faith. And then in verse 5, I hear a language I had not known. The, the language here may be Egyptian, but another translation is this, a voice we did not know, to, to refer to the verses that are following. So I've said this before, but Hebrew is, is difficult to translate, and so it could have been a language I had not known, but it might be a voice I had not known. In verse 6, I relieved the burden. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. And with specific language here, God reminds Israel of their time and slavery in Egypt. And then verse 7, in distress I called you and I delivered you. You answered in the secret place of thunder. This might refer to God's appearance at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, although the, sun, the thunder and the lightning were frequent signs of his presence. And then it mentions Meribah in verse 7. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Meribah is also in, uh, mentioned in Exodus 17 and in Numbers 20. Um, several places throughout the Hebrew Bible you will see Meribah and uh, Massa. The Israelites were said to have traveled through these locations during the Exodus, although uh, the continuous list of varied stations that they visited in Numbers 33 doesn't mention these. Um, but again, you do see this in Exodus 17, and it's mentioned at the same time as Massa in Exodus 17. So Meribah and Massa are mentioned together, which a lot of scholars would suggest that means it is the same location. But other biblical mentions of Massa and Meribah, such as in the blessing, uh, the blessing of Moses, which is... Um, you can read about that in Exodus 32. Um, they're mentioned together and it really kind of, or they're mentioned separately and it kind of implies that they're distinct locations. And, um, you know, there are people that have ideas of where these locations were, but you really don't know for sure. And they're also mentioned several other places in the Bible. So they were real locations, but as to where they were and if they were the same or different, nobody knows. I am going to suggest that they are different. Um, but, but again, you, you know, that's not a definitive statement. That's just my opinion. Verse nine, you shall not bow down to a foreign God. This warning implies that Israel was not observing this basic commandment from the 10 commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, so God is commanding them again. Don't bow down to another God. And, and we've seen several times in Scripture where Israel disobeyed this basic commandment. 
And God's just reminding them, don't bow down to another God. There will be dire consequences. Verse 10, I am the Lord your God. So the basis of not bowing down to another God is because God is the only God. He is the God of Israel. And it's strongly reminiscent of the preamble to the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and verse 2, where he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. In other words, because of this, for the simple fact that I am God, do this. And so he gives the Ten Commandments after that. Also in verse 10, he says, uh, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Much of Israel's history as recorded in Joshua through Chronicles, is the story of God's people looking for satisfaction without God. How often do we do that in our own lives until we realize that this stuff does not satisfy? If I could get more of this, more education, more money, if I could get a spouse, if I could just make this much money, then things will be okay and it never satisfy. And if they were, if they were worried about rain, they would turn to Baal, the people of Israel. First Kings 18, we're reminded of the story of Elijah. The people of Israel turned to Baal. If they were worried about enemies, they wanted a strong king. For Samuel 8, they kept forgetting that they had a God who could and would fulfill all their needs, not with difficulty, but with ease, because he created everything. Now, often we, we say we can trust God with our salvation, our eternal security, but we don't trust him with the smaller things in our lives, our relationships, our money, our jobs. And this is convicting, I mean, to me and to really anyone who reads it. Psalm 81, 12 here, he says, So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts. This sounds very familiar, like Romans 1, 24. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So there comes a point where God, as patient as he is, gives people over to what they really want. Verse 13, Oh, that my people would listen to me. God's compassion for Israel is clearly seen here. Yes, there is discipline among God's people. If you want to know if God loves you, are you disciplined for your sin? If you are, that is certainly proof that you are his child. But even though he's talking about giving people over, his patience is persistent, and it's it's very clear here. And his heart is that people would listen to him. Verse 13, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my, in my ways. And so his compassion for his people is clearly seen in this verse. And so uh, this psalm, uh, again, written uh, for the specific occasion of um, the Feast of Booths. And so it's very clear here, but there's, there's kind of two different um, attitudes or ideas going at the same time here, juxtaposed with each other, but they stem from the same source. So you have God reminding people that honoring him and obeying him is necessary, that he commands that. But at the same time, you have this idea that even though he has disciplined his people, given people over to the, the desires of their own hearts, that he still loves them and his heart and his desires for people to repent. So uh, this is a robust setting, a hymnic setting of Psalm 81. There are seven stanzas. So enjoy this as you listen to it. Here is Psalm 81. Thank you for listening today to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Hands 
found rest You call in trouble my response In thunder I expressed And by the streams of Meribah I put you to the test You own my people I will speak O oh, Israel listen now Let no strange God be in your midst And to them do not die I am the Lord, your God, who saved from Egypt, brought you out. Then open wide your mouth to me, and it I'll surely fill. But to my voice they gave no heed, my Israel spurned me still. I left them to the stubborn heart, to walk by their own way. My people would me hear And Israel choose my way How quickly I would subjugate Their every enemy Upon their adversaries all My outstretched hand I'd lay Then all who hate the Lord would cringe And fear and dread abide But Israel with the finest wind Always keep supplied Yes, I with honey from the rock Would keep you satisfied